Okay, so hello everyone. Today we welcome again Neil Lazarevich for his third talk about uh, rigidity, uh, finite index rigidity. Great, thanks. Um, okay, there is some echo. Oh. But so we stated the, the new goal. The new goal is to prove the following relation between uh, volume and complexity. Let me just restate this. X is a hyperbolic one level graph. Uh, then uh, there exists some M such that for every P and co-compact action of a group on X, um, we have the complexity, some complexity of G is um, something of this one, where the constants depend on x. This is some echo, no? No, we're good. Okay. Um, yeah. So that, that's that's a theorem. Um, we'll see the proof really tomorrow, but we have to sort of uh, set the uh, the ground for the for the proof. Um, Yeah, so th this thing is minimal number of uh, cells in the two skeleton in this case. Of a space that's sort of classifying space for G, but up to dimension M of a simply shell. Sorry, simplicial, because the word simplicial here is important. Simplicial uh, K say such that um, I1 of K is G and I N of K is zero. Okay, and this is just the number of cells number of edges and vertices. Okay, more, more questions? Great, I mean, we will not really see where this comes into play today, but, but we will count number of two cells, so. I mean, if you need to remember anything of this definition, it's the fact that it counts two cells. Okay, right. Cells in a two skeleton. Okay. So here is the uh, the main tool, and the main tool is uh, Mineev's bicombing. And, and what is that? So let me give you the definition. The definition will be maybe a bit long. Ah, maybe before that, I wanted to introduce a notation. If you, if you have to remember anything of my mini series, it's the following notation. Sorry. So in the paper, it's bold font delta, but I'm just going to use the, the letter delta here to mean a constant that depends on x. So every time I write delta, it could be a different constant that depends on x.
maybe a say on zero constant. So something like, I mean, this is really something like writing this, but without writing this. Good. That's, if if you take anything, take this. Anyone who wrote a paper on hyperbolic groups knows how tracking of uh, constants. I mean, but usually those constants are are you have the delta because the space is delta hyperbolic, and then you take ten deltas for something, and then hundred delta for something else, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Or maybe you want to say the number of uh, vertices in a ball of radius delta is delta. Okay, so. Uh, Yeah, that's fine. Good. Uh, also, the number of oh, yeah. Okay. So this is the ball of radius delta around some point. Okay. What? What? It's just so useful. I mean. Using ball delta, I guess uh, that's mine, but uh, yeah, do, do adopt this notation if you write anything about hyperbolic groups. Good, now we can, now we can get started. Uh, we will we'll already see it here, so this is. <laughs> so yeah, so the, the setting is, we have our uh, our graph x, little graph, and we have a, a group acting on on x. And I assume this is maybe this throughout the talk. I'm going to assume that this is what I call a simple selection. By which I obviously mean the GX by uh, cellular maps, but I mean more than that. I want the quotient to be simply shell. Okay, and in order to achieve this, you just need to, I mean, if, if it doesn't already happen for X, just take the Borisantic subdivision. So let's not worry about those things. Uh, this is also true if it's, not a, if, it's, if it's not a graph, which we'll need later on. Okay. Um, so here is the a bunch of definitions. So a bicombing uh, is a function from takes two vertices of x. So when I write x, I usually mean the vertices of x okay. uh, into c one of x with the Okay, so, so these, these are one chains. Okay. Um, over you. Okay, so when, whenever I write uh, C1 of C1 of X, I, I mean over Q and not over Z, which is not too worry about this. Um, Good. Yeah. So, so it's a function, and we'll say that this is a bicombing, a Q bicombing. If the boundary of Q X Y is Y minus X. <clears throat> So maybe what you should what you should have in mind is um, is the following. I have I have two points in my in my graph, two vertices, and I can just take maybe a path connecting them. Okay, so what I just drew here is a is a one chain. I, I give one with this orientation to each one of those of those edges. Okay, and this indeed satisfies that the boundary of this chain is y minus x okay but what we what we have here is we allow more right because we take coefficients over q i can decide okay instead of going like this maybe i can do 
half, half, and have also another well because. Yeah, so this is what it allows us. It sort of allows us to look at several paths at once, but still think of them as one path because the endpoints are expected to be. Um, ah, and maybe another thing is that I want Q of x to be zero. I don't want to consider stupid cycles in the case that uh, X and Y are different. We'll see how we, yeah, in, in principle, you can, you can add the cycle here. That's true, but we'll see the rest of the definition. There are more, more assumptions. So this is one of them, just being a bicomic. Well, why is it a core cube? Is there something you're going to tell us about? Why is it over a cube? Because I want to allow those things. If I would do it over, over Z, I would not be able to add those things. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Uh, so you are, you are allowing my options? Yes. I mean, my, whatever. Any, any kind of one chain that, that satisfies this. But coefficients are now. This is not a geodesic. Yeah, it's a rational, rational, or homological, yeah. yeah. Good. Um, so this is one, one definition. Another thing, so the, I'm, I'm gonna list properties that we would like to expect of our, I mean, a nice function, you. Um, so yeah, so the, the next one is being quasi, quasi geodesic. Uh, which means the following. So for every X and Y, the support of the spy combing which is just the, the edges on which this bicombing is non-zero, uh, should be uh, contained in the delta neighborhood. Delta, yeah. Delta neighborhood of the, of any geodesic connecting X and <clears throat> It's one thing and another thing is, well, we see that this is actually not that, not needed. The one, the one norm of, of QXY, which is just the sum of the, of the absolute value of the coefficient is uh, bounded from about by delta, another delta. Delta is constant. Delta is con yeah. Delta. I mean, is a constant that depends only on x somehow. Okay, here it's it's on q, but we'll at some point we'll say there is such a q, and we'll fix it, and we we'll forget about the fact that you can change it. No. Good question. No, it's not, right? Because each time the letter delta appears on the board, it's potentially a different constant. Great question. Should I use another color to you know the bold bold delta? Okay. X. Yes. It's a comma. It's Yes, vertices. Mm -hmm. 
I, I said it, but didn't write. Mm -hmm. When I when I I think of X as both the simply shell complex and its vertex. Set. Great. Um, yeah. The third copy. So this was quasi being quasi geodesic. Yeah. So what does it mean? It means that just do a drawing. This is X. This is Y. The bicombing lives in some delta neighborhood. Okay. So for what Dolan asked before, here we potentially can add some cycles somewhere. Just add some cycle here, but but this tells us actually no. I mean, you can add cycles, but they, they also have to be in this neighborhood. So, so the second condition does not follow. Sorry? Second condition of what did you do? The second condition does not follow from the no no. The first one is just any. You no, can no, take no, no. ah. Uh, this does not. Yeah, it does not follow from uh, from this because you can just take a cycle and put whatever weights on it, and that, that's it. Yeah. Um. Okay, yeah. So quasi jealousy. Next thing. Hmm? Also negative weight. This is one, one, one norm. Yeah, one. Norm. Yeah, maybe I should. I should have said you can always represent any one chain, and this is really how we think of them as orientation plus positive positive weights. Right? Not to. Allow, I mean, I don't want to take an edge E with some weight and also the negative. E with another wait. I mean, this is this. I don't really count as a thing. And when, and when I do this, then I can define the one norm. Makes sense. I, I, don't, I don't want to count this as as norm two, but norm zero, because actually, okay, good. Um, technicalities. It's not that important. And next thing. There is an action. We want this thing to be G equivariant. Mm. This thing. Okay. Yeah. Three, four. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Yes, and we'll see. I mean, the the last property is really the the one that's important. And okay, let let, let me first finish, and then then I can remark on, on what. So, um, what else? Anti, it's anti-symmetric. Okay, so. If we had the bicombing from x to y, then we want the bicombing from y to x to just be the minus of this bicombing, just going down. It. Which matches with this, right? Okay. Um, and the last and most important property is the bounded, bounded defect. Which says that if you look at x, y, and z, three points, then <clears throat> go from x to y, and then from y to z, and then from z to x, then most of those things cancel, and we are, we are left with some bounded, <clears throat> bounded. Again, delta is some some constant. So, um, yeah, so I mean, it, yes. So I mean, the motivation of of Minev for coming up with this is really bounded bounded cohomology. So, so yeah, that's, that's really where it comes from. Um, <clears throat> Yeah. 
Yeah, the opposite direction is negative. Sorry. So you just compare them. The other direction, opposite direction edge, You're saying this can be easily achieved by anti symmetrizing the. But I think that, like, when you're in L, you yeah. see, like, direction and the opposite direction. Ah, you're asking about what I wrote. Yes, I, I only take, I mean, when I write a one chain, I only take uh, for each edge, unoriented edge, I only take one orientation and the coefficient there. I'm just wondering if and the positive one is even better. <laughs> you can declare that E plus E bar is zero. Yes. I mean, that's fine, but you still need, I mean, okay, still need to say what the, I don't know. yeah, that's, that's good. Um, yeah, so, so here's the definition. So I, I call them globally stable bicombing. Is uh, is a Q that satisfies all of them. Q is all of those probably things together. Yeah. Um, yeah. So why why do I call it a globally stable bicombing? Because there is something called a globally stable cylinder, uh, which is something that uh, Rips and Sela considered. And they are related, they are not exactly the same, but they are related to this thing over Z. So if you think of this definition over Z, wait, okay, I'm lying a bit, but the geodesic bicombing, meaning for every X and Y, I choose one path, uh, you can probably take it to be, uh, I mean, okay, some, some canonical path. Uh, and what this definition would tell you is that when you take three points, then okay, you have a path from X to Y. And now the path from, let's say, Y to Z should basically trace back the most of the geodesic from X to Y if, if you want to have this bounded defect. So what you can, can have is it traces it back and then maybe goes on another short uh, excursion and then comes back, traces it and so on, and then goes to Z. And the same goes for uh, X, X and Z. So. Okay, and the number of those uh, different things is, is bounded, right? That's the bounded defect. Okay, so this is... Uh, generalization or a weaker version of, uh, of those uh, are called canonical representatives. Were concealed by apes and apes himself. Okay. Yeah. Ah. Wait. No, I I wrote the wrong thing. Globally stable uh, stable bicombing. If it satisfies one up one up to five for the group of X. This is this is what I want. To write. Okay, this is the this is the global part of say, global means. It's under the whole group and not just any. Okay, and here is the uh, here is the theorem of Mineyev. <clears throat> so. As every, say, locally finite 
uh, hyperbolic graph with a co-compact action. It meets a globally stable body. And maybe I should say that uh, actually Minev doesn't phrase this theorem in, in this way. He assumes he assumes more. He assumes that it's a globally stable by coming for some free freely acting group. So G is a free reacting group for, for T, but actually if you look at the proof, it works for, for out X as long as as long as you have such a group, as long as okay. So that's that's our main tool. So I wanted to draw. I think it doesn't it doesn't matter. Wait, I mean, it's it's is really the technical point about whether such things and bit lattices and whether those. It's uh, I, I think it, it's relevant for the, the proof is really I mean the only place where you really use the fact that you have such an action is. Okay, he starts with a free action, and so his starting point is just taking a, a, an equivalent geodesic by coming for the action. But actually, you can average over all geodesics as the first step for what, what you're doing next. So really, what you need is, I mean, I don't think, think you even need this compact group action. You really just need the, the, to know something about the size of, of balls, like... The, it's it's really geometric. It, uh, to be what? Yes, that, that's the only place where the group of it is. Sorry? So a globally stable bicoming, I take G to be ot x. Yeah, yeah, because I edit it afterwards. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make the remark that this actually follows from, from the rest. If you assume that you have uh, a co-compact action. And, and the reason is, if you think of, I mean, take X and Y and think of a path joining X and Y, then you know that qxy by the bounded defect is basically the same as uh, qx to the first point in your path, et cetera, all the way up to the uh, last point y, plus an error that you accumulate by, by doing this bounded defect. But the error is something like delta the distance between x and y, and each one of them is just bounded because you have g equivariance, right? So that there are finitely many of q, x, and a neighbor up to the g action. So each one of them is bounded, so you get the whole thing is bounded by delta x. Just this one is the same delta. Yeah. yeah, maybe I should have said in the notation, if I write delta one, I actually mean a, a number and not just this vague thing. Good. Um, yes. Yeah, so yeah, so the thing is this this is 
like stronger than than hyperbolicity in a sense, but but actually it's it's equivalent. But, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean the the the, the bounded defect and quasi the fact that it's quasi geodesic would have to tell you that the the supports are sort of uh, match the most part. So it would give you hyperbolicity. Yeah. <laughs> Very good question. Sorry? Mm. I said that, uh, what was it? Three plus five imply this. Hmm? With the co compact, I mean, G, which is co compact. No, no, the support is important. The support is important, and you cannot get. Yeah. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> so, um, where are we now? So, two, two facts. Later, are the following. So one is that for such a bicombing, fact number one, uh, for every x and y, the the soup norm of q x y is bound. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so I mean what what's the what's the proof here? The proof is something like uh, you take here is your x and y. You want to show that it's bounded, so you pick some edge in the support, and you want to sorry. Ah, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not gonna attempt doing it. It's it's very technical. It's a like repeated averaging of geodesic by coming. No, so I'm I'm just focusing on some facts that we need about the the by coming. Um, yes. Yeah, so what, what's the idea here is you take an edge in the support of uh, in the support of this q x y and you want to bound the coefficient that q x y gives to this edge e and you think of as Connect it with geodesics to uh, X and Y. And a note that maybe pick a point that's close to E, but far, far enough, or is bigger than some one of the deltas there. And now it's basically something like a bounded defect thing. So you know that QXY is this up to an L the same as QX to X1, X1 to, X to Y1, Y1 to Y, right? But E is not in the support of this guy, nor is it in the support of this guy because we took X1 and Y1 far enough. So far would be bigger than this delta. <laughs> And so the coefficient of, of E appears only in Q of X1, Y1. Yeah, so the coefficient of E in Q, X, Y is basically the coefficient the same in Q, X1, 
y1 up to this error of the bounded defect. But this is now just bounded by the distance between x and But I mean, this this we know to begin with, right? I mean, it's a it's it's a hyperbolic, it's a hyperbolic space. No, maybe I didn't understand that. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it follows from quasi from the fact that it's quasi, quasi geodesic by. Is this clear? I'm, I'm going to do a lot of hand waving proofs of facts, and as you can see, I'm just using deltas. Like, good. So actually, the bicoming is sort of is bounded along the along the way, no matter what are x and y. And another thing is that it's sort of bounded from below. In what sense? In the following sense. So. Fact number two is that for every x and y, and for every point that I take on the geodesic between x and y, the if I take qxy and I restrict it to the edges that line the ball of radius sum delta around z, then the one norm of this would be at least. What's the proof here? This I'm really going to sketch. So here is x, here is y, we have the geodesic, we have the points z. And what I'm saying is that if you take a ball delta around z, then the restriction of the bicombing, so here I have this bicombing. To, to this ball has at least uh, norm one, right? That's the that's the fact. And what's the proof is so sort of cut, I mean, cut this part out. You see that you get sort of a a chain that leads you from x to certain points in this ball, right? And the same for y. So they end in points in this model. And I can make sure that these po points are distant. There's no cancellation between those two. Okay, so, I, so what do I get? I get that I need to, for, for the bicombing to, to be a Q bicombing and its boundary to be just X and Y, I somehow have to connect those. Okay, in order to connect them, I, I need at least twice the, uh, the one norm of, of each one of them. So, sorry. It's somewhat clear. I can think about it as a, um, a sort of a Kirchhoff law, right? Whatever goes into the ball must come out of the ball. So something in here should, should carry all of this uh, information through. And to carry it, it should be of norm at least one, because this is what exited from x. The, it, yeah, it's definitely large enough so that you cannot go around it. And it's large enough to sort of to see that this is disjoint from, from that. Okay. Good. Um, so these are the two facts. And from fact number two, we can get fact, fact number three which is the, in the same kind of setting, there exists an edge E in this ball such that the bicombing on E, so the coefficient of E in this bicombing 
is uh, at least some number uh, one over one over the. Okay, why is that? Just because the number of edges in a ball is some delta. So at least one of those edges should have one over delta of the. Okay, so these are the facts that we'll need uh, later on. But now let's see what's our second, second tool. And that's really the, the heart of the, the heart of the proof is to translate this bicombing into another more geometric object, um, which I call, yeah. Two. So are you assuming that the distance between x and y is bigger than delta? Because x and y are closely. Yeah, maybe, I, maybe I'm assuming that x and y are different because of that, that's the only case where I don't. But if, if, they if they have distance one, then. No, then, then still, somehow, whatever comes out of X should be carried by the bicombing to Y. It's still fine, but uh, okay, don't, don't worry about this. That's, that's my short answer. Is it formally true for every X and Y? Or do you need X and Y to be? No, you, you don't need X and Y to be. Basically, the delta neighborhood for x and y is only the next right? Yeah, I mean, the proof, this, as I stated, it doesn't work as I stated, it, but, but the same idea still works. Really, don't worry about it. Worrying is, is bad for your skin or something. Uh, good. Yes. Of fact two as you just it's related to somehow it's related to them. It's it's mostly I would say related to the fact that it's a bicombing. The fact that you have to again whatever comes out of the source X should should reach Y, and so whatever it passes in the way should see all of this uh, uh, current. I have the capacity to. Yeah, that's yeah, it's definitely yeah, definitely is. Yes. Okay. Um so here is the here is the second second tool. Um it's singular what I I call singular weighted G weighted patterns. So what's a pattern first, or a singular pattern? So I have X is, a K is now a, a two-dimensional simplicial complex. Okay, eventually it's gonna be the two skeleton of this. You remember the definition of the C2M, blah, blah, blah. That's the two. It's the same two. Okay. And a, a singular pattern is, is a graph. So this is a, an immersed graph. Immersed graph. Into and when I say into K, I actually mean like the topological realization of K, such that um, the following vertices. You know what? I'm not going to write the definition. I'm going to draw the definition. It's much better. Okay, so here's. Here is K, has two cells, edges, so on. It's a piece of K. 
And what I ask of the pattern is the following. I want the vertices to be of one of two kinds. First of all, the vertices of F are sent injectively, they embed in K. Okay, so I have here the vertices and they land on either the edges or the interior. Okay, not on vertices of K. Okay, and, and I uh, distinguish the ones that are on the edges. These are called the regular. And the ones that are in the interior, I call singular. Okay, and just not to confuse with the vertices of the complex, let's give them another name. Let's call them connectors, okay? So the vertices of F are called connectors. Yeah, so far these are the vertices. Now the edges. The edges can connect uh, Exactly, yeah. They, so again, they embed and they embed it to the, either the edges or the interior of uh, cells, two cells. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have uh, the edges of F, which are called segments, they connect connectors, right? And they can connect regular connectors, in which case, think of them as being just straight lines inside the, the synthesis. Okay. And uh, so unlike, if you know, Dunwoody patterns, they're allowed to cross. Okay. This is why it's not an embedded graph, but an immersed graph. There's some, some crossing happening. Okay, but this is, this is not a connector. Yeah. Good. Um, all right, so this is... Uh, Second condition. In this drawing, those are the vertices of the graph and these are edges. This is, yeah, the crossing point just happens in the image and not in, in F. I mean, so far the F that I drew is, is this graph. And lying at some, some vertices. Ah, and I didn't say the, Singular things can also connect. Okay, so now the third condition is what happens at each one of the connectors. So a singular connector has... Between themselves, it will never happen. So you can, I mean, I'm not going to use it. So let's assume it doesn't happen. Okay, so each singular connector has exactly one segment coming out of it, okay? Connecting it to a, to a regular connector, we just said. Okay, and each regular connector has an edge coming out of it in, exactly one edge coming out of it in each one of the cells that, it, uh, that are incident to it. So I'll have one here, and I'll have one say there. It's clear. Each one of them has to go through to all connections. Okay, so also here, I'll have something, maybe a singular one, that's a possibility. Here, maybe another one, another singular one. Did I do all of them? Yeah, so this is, this is a pattern. They list all the properties. Uh, I didn't say there are finitely many connectors and segments in each edge and simplex. And pa -pa -pam. Good. Yeah, are we happy? Yes. The regular connector is necessarily extended across everything. Yes. Yes. So uh, the regular connectors are what, I mean, uh, look like a Dan, Dan Woody pattern. Look like yeah, yeah. 
Okay, and we'll say that it's a weighted singular pattern if on each connector I give a weight, okay, a non-negative non weight. So the difference is that they can cross. So depends on who you ask what the pattern is. If you ask Dunwoody, pattern cannot cross. If you ask me, <laughs> can cross. But yeah, okay, maybe it's uh, not the best uh, terminology. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Great. Exactly. Um, Okay, and we say it's weighted. Weighted if there is a weight from the vertices, the connectors to zero infinity. And I, I ask for the weight of singular connectors, singular connector to be zero. Yeah, so just put, you put numbers. Uh, yeah. Half, zero, so on. I, uh, your favorite numbers. <coughs> Great. So here's how they are related to the bicombing. Yeah, so now we're back at the setting of the theorem. So what was the setting of the theorem? We have X, I have a body graph, and we have a group acting on, on X, right? And we want to say something about the complexity of G, okay? So there is some... Uh, <clears throat> I mean, so, okay, so we're interested in two skeletons of simplicial complexes whose pi one is G. Okay, so let's take this also into account. So let K bar be a, a, be a two dimensional simplicial complex with pi one. Okay. So we know that uh, G acts on the universal cover. And what I want to do is I want to sort of build a map from uh, K to X. So here is X, and I want to sort of build a map like this. So what I can obviously do is I can build a map from the vertices of, of K to the vertices of X. Right here. So choose some map. Let's call it capital G, okay, which is G equivalent. Yeah, with respect to the action of G on the universal cover by deck transformation and the action of G on X, which is given. So how do you do that? You just pick representatives for the orbits of G here. You map them wherever you want in, in X, and then you extend it G equivalently. And the, the reason why you can do that is that the action here is free. Uh, in whatever, yeah, and extend G equivalently. 
Yes. So far, are we happy? Good. <clears throat> Now, what's, what's my goal? My goal is to get uh, from, from this map some singular weighted pattern on K, which will be T invariant. So how do we do that? Well, okay, we have this map between vertices. Now let's consider an edge. So I have an edge here. This is an edge in, uh, in K. Okay, between X and Y. Okay, then I look at the image of X and Y, so I get some PX and PY in X. And we know that in X, we have this bicombing of Binev. Okay, so let's use that. So take the bicombing Q. So this is U of Px, Py. Okay. And for each edge in the support of Q, put a connector on this edge, okay? But don't just put any connector, put them so that they're sort of quasi ordered as they are here. So the closer you are to X, you want to be closer to phi X, you want to be closer to X. Okay, but uh, obviously there's, I mean, there could be edges here that are the same distance from X or from Y. And for those, you have to decide who to put first and who to put second. Yeah? So you put connect those. So uh, regular connector. For each uh, edge in the support of U. Mix T1. Okay. Yeah. They have to be different, yeah. Yeah, we said that the... Yeah. And we can also put a weight already. What What's going to be the weight? What... What weight will I put on a connector here? Yeah, the, the weight that the bicombing gave to the corresponding edge. Uh, the U restricted to the corresponding edge. It's the edge of C. Okay. Balance weights or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's see how they they come about. So now I, I mean I define the thing on, on the edges. Next thing I, I want to do is two cells. Okay, so I already have those connectors. I use yellow, I think. Okay, and, and on the X side I have the picture that we already drew, which is this slim. Yeah. Triangle of bicom. This is this and this. Is. And now what you do is the following. If if you have an edge here, so an edge that is in the support of both phi x phi y and phi y phi z, but not in the support of phi x phi z, and in the same orientation in those two supports. Then you put a, a segment between the two points. Okay, so maybe I should have used different colors, but. 
So if I have an edge which is the same orientation in both of them and does not appear in the support of the third one, I put a, a regular a, a segment connecting the two connectors. In any other case, I would just put a singular uh, singular connect. So if <clears throat> if an edge, for instance, appears in all three supports, I put a singular connector in each one of them. Okay. If it appears with different orientations in two of the supports, I put a singular singular uh, connector to. If they appear in only one of them, I put a singular. <laughs> so you put a segment between two regular connectors, if and only if. So a segment between uh, regular connectors, if and only if the corresponding edge, so EC1 is EC2 with orientation, and uh, this one belongs to the support of whatever the thing was. So C1 says X, X, Y, then it should be in the support of phi X, phi Y. And not, so E, C1, with any orientation is not in the support of the third gang. In all other cases, I, I add a singular connector and connect it to the uh, to the to the corresponding regular one. What are the the regular connectors are? in bijection with the support of the bicombing. Yes. This is in case. These are two simplex. Small in, in what sense? I mean, you could send those two vertices very far away here. Okay. Good. No, no, no. I'm, I'm Focusing on take a two simplex, we did it like vertices, edges now, two simplexes of. Yeah. I mean, there will be one because everything is one ended really at the end. So definitely be two simplexes. In K, yeah? K is the one that sort of a presentation complex for G. Where was it? <coughs> Local finiteness, no, but uh, I mean, the K is locally finite. I'm doing it for for all, what do you mean for all x y for every sim for every simplex yeah. yeah for every simplex I do that and I didn't say also here once you made some cho I mean there were cho some choices here here there are no no more choices left but here there are some choices do them g equivalently yeah 
Yeah. 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 I okay. Again, x and y. Maybe it's not clear already from the drawing, but they are connected by an edge here in K. I only look at the edges when I do this. That's an edge. No, it's an edge with connectors on it. That's fine. Different colors. It's a simplex of dimension one and diameter one. And diameter one. Yeah. Good. Um, okay. Are we happy with the instruction? So, there are very far away, but 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 okay. I mean, they could be very far away, but but they're still it's a fixed thing. Like you, there are only finitely many orbits of edges. Each one of them there's a pair of points in in X. Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, yeah. So, so really, the the proof of the theorem uh, will go as as follows. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. It's exactly that. Yeah. Um, Okay, so given such a, ah, I didn't say, uh, we should define the weight, the weight also on the new, I mean, I defined it here. I didn't define it for the singular connectors, but what's the weight of a singular connector? Zero, good, following. Uh, yeah, so what's, so how would the proof go? The proof would go by bounding, um, Sort of the total weight of this uh, of these patterns. So before we do that, let's just note that by the way we constructed it, uh, the pattern f in uh, uh, as it k is g invariant or g equivalent. If I think of it as a map. Uh -huh. And and so we get a pattern. Let's call it f bar in k bar, the complex whose pi one is g. Okay, and now this is a this is for us will be a compact thing, and a, so some finite graph on a finite complex. Right, and for this thing, I, I would like to measure how much weight this thing has. So let's define it. So we have a weight on the uh, on the pattern, so we do the following. So for every, uh, let, let me, more definitions, every connected component, component of F is called a track. Okay. And, and now for each track, For each track T, we define the weight of T to just be the maximal weight of a connector on, the, on this track. Okay. okay. And we define the weight of the of the pattern weight of the pattern to be the um, the sum of the weights of the tracks t Okay, so th this is really the, the object that we, we look at. 
the weight of the, of the pattern. And here's the, the proposition that I'll not have time to prove. Says that in our setting, um, yeah, in our setting, there exists a map phi. Okay, you remember there was a choice of a map phi here. G map G map. And such that the corresponding pattern weighted pattern weighted pattern um, has total weight bounded above by delta times the number of two sets. I mean, so how would the proof of the theorem go? The proof would be, you know, choose the, this k to be the one that realizes the complexity. Okay, so here I have the weight of the pattern is bounded from above by the complexity of the group, the one hand. And what we'll discuss tomorrow is the other inequality that has this, um, the total weight of the pattern is bounded from below by the volume. Okay, so that's uh, with those two, we get one of the inequalities, which is the, the hard inequality, okay, the harder one. Um, yeah, I don't have time to explain the proof of this, but. Uh, um, yeah, let, let me just say that at this point, we use the fact that. It is one ended. Um, yeah. Yeah, let me just let me just finish here for today. Thanks. There is no yes. yes. You found some randomness. Is it the way I presented the result? Kind of like by combining uh, randomness actually, because you have this weight which is equal to one and two by combining you can associate the mark of chain which is a random. Uh, path from next to y, which would be a random question. I mean, it's uh, as random as, yeah, okay. So there is kind of probabilistic method that is, uh, that's happening there. And uh, I mean, you, you didn't do it, but uh, if I could, if straightforward, uh, it would be to use kind of. Uh, Regular, simple rules. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, okay. Th those will not be bounded. That's the, I mean, it's true that most of the weight will be uh, probably around the geodesic connecting X and Y. You, you mean the first, like you do it? Um, like you restrict to some events. That to the event that starts at X and ends in Y. Yeah, yeah, but this is one. not this is not bounded around the The question is do you get the bounded defect? I mean the bounded defect is the 
Uh, it could be. I mean, I don't know. Not uh, if you have a better proof than Minev. I mean, I would suggest that you write it. That's the <laughs> no. Okay. No, 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 because you delta should depend only on x. Delta depends only on x. So you take a different group, different complex, you run this thing. This delta should not depend on that, it depends only on x. Yeah, no, otherwise, okay. it's like saying every group is hyperbolic because you know, match the delta to the x, y, z. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, okay, uh, maybe so I should say. I mean, this, this does come from, I, I guess, Stallings, maybe the first that sort of consider this kind of thing, but done with the resolution, that's the, that's the word that should be said here, is when you have, when X is a tree, then you can sort of run the same, same thing. And in a tree, you can take the bicombing to just be the geodesic path. And what you get there is, is really not a singular one. It's a, it's a regular pattern, no crossing. It's the nice, nicest thing. Like on each cell, you would just get something like that. And, and you can sort of reconstruct a tree that is somehow geometrically better. It's, it's more fitted with, the, with, with K. It's called the resolution of. Like, Sorry. For Dunwoody, I mean, for Dunwoody, it was proving accessibility and this kind of uh, like you show this. This is this is an accessibility result. But I mean, that's like you think of it as, as what Dunwoody did is is exactly this. He says, in a resolution, there is a bound on how many tracks you can have that are not parallel and the bound is in terms of the one cells and two cells of the, of the complex so and this this proof is really modeled on on what he did in this in a sense like, Yes, that's the. Yes. I mean, there's also the the weight thing that I mean. Okay. But but in that sense, it's it's counting tracks, right? That's this is really what I want to do. But since I'm not really counting tracks, but I'm also counting the weight of these things. Yeah. And, and if you sort of, if you have an idea of uh, what goes on there, then what you really should be thinking of is whenever tracks are crossing, it happened, um, so it happens like this. You, can, you cannot have two tracks that cross and they are, they are far, far away. This cannot happen. If they cross, they have to be sort of the same level. So something like that. that, that's fine. 
Okay, so really it does look like a, like a done with the pattern for the most part and play with that. I can, I was interested, I'll, I'll, there is a statement behind. <laughs> yes, if, if they intersect, they correspond to edges which are a distance delta apart. This is, I mean, this is a triviality by the way we chose it. This is the, quasi, the fact that it's quasi-ordered. Okay. Of, yeah. Yeah, it could happen. This is where, I mean, in the tree case, this is where folding happens. Um, the statement is something about existence, right? Yeah. There exists phi such that. Yeah, I mean, the, the phi is what you imagine it to be. You sort of minimize the displacement. That's, yeah. The, yeah. that's the right thing to do there. And but is it an implicit thing or to move? Is there a complex introduction? Okay. No, it's just, it's, a, it's for one, one step. You choose the displacement, displacement and you show that. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, I, I was planning on giving the details of this, but uh, okay. Thanks. <laughs>